Good evening and welcome. My name is Colin Anthony, and I'm the Associate Director for Undergraduate Outreach for the Center for Ethics and Society here at Stanford University. Our center aims to encourage and promote ethical reflection through not only research and scholarship in the classroom, but also through student engagement and community events such as this one this evening. In planning this event, I have had the unique privilege of working with many undergraduate university leaders on campus without whom this event would not have been possible. This includes our co-sponsors of tonight's event, the student group CS Plus Social Good. Founded in 2013, this group offers leadership opportunities that range from summer fellowships at the Haas Center for Public Service and opportunities for courses where students can build projects for nonprofit organizations. In my work with CS Plus Social Good, I have been constantly amazed and by the passion, rigor, and commitment that undergraduates have brought to the table. And so I urge undergraduates in the audience here to reach out to me if you have an idea that, co that connects ethics and society that you would like to see um, envisioned in society and at this university. So please reach out to our center and reach out to CS Plus Social Good if you have any ideas that you would like to work on and, be and become a reality. Before moving forward, I want to share with you the format of this evening's event. First, I will turn it over to Alexander Lamb, an undergraduate who's affiliated with the center, who's going to be giving a sort of brief overview presentation of the Theranos saga before introducing our speakers. The interview is set to conclude at 8 p.m., after which there will be a Q&A period for 30 minutes. I will allow for specific audience members if they need to leave at 8 p.m. to exit the auditorium during that time. At 8 o'clock, after the interview concludes, there will be microphones in each of the aisles, as well as a microphone in the balcony. And at that time, I will ask you to line up for question and answers. With that said, please join me in welcoming Alexander Lamb, an undergraduate and affiliate with the Center of Ethics and Society, who will guide us through the story of Theranos and then introduce our, sp our speakers. Alexander? Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm very excited to be here. I'd like to begin tonight's event with a photo. Uh, one second. Four years ago, Elizabeth Holmes, the CEO and founder of Theranos, sat in this very auditorium. Here, she promised to deliver technology that would revolutionize the healthcare industry in the 21st century. The idea behind her technology was simple, yet groundbreaking. With only a single prick of blood, patients could gain access to hundreds of blood test results and use them to make important medical decisions. As shown here on the cover of Forbes magazine, Elizabeth Holmes is holding what she called a nanotube of blood between her very fingers. Because of this technology's potential impact on the health of millions of people, she claimed that it was, quote, the most important thing humanity has ever built. This vision gripped the imagination of Silicon Valley and attracted influential figures to support her company, including the former US Secretary of State, George Shultz, who is the grandfather of one of our guests tonight, Tyler Shultz. She also convinced investors such as Rupert Murdoch of the Fox News Corporation and the Walton family of Walmart to back her company. At its peak, Theranos was valued at over $9 billion, and Elizabeth Holmes was named the world's youngest self-made female billionaire. Heralded as the next Steve Jobs, she dressed in black turtlenecks and described her technology as the iPod of healthcare. However, despite her lofty promises and celebrity status, there were deep flaws in both her technology and business practices. In her relentless pursuit of success, she manipulated lab results, deceived government inspectors, and instilled a crippling fear in her employees as she struggled to hide the fact that the technology she promised was simply not a reality. In fact, in a brazen case of deception, Elizabeth Holmes guided Joe Biden through what turned out to be a fake laboratory with staged equipment in an attempt to convince the public that her technology was ready and that she could be trusted. Her ruse had worked. In 2013, despite glaring deficiencies in Theranos' faulty technology, 
Elizabeth Holmes scaled out products to neighborhood Walgreens stores, where patients made serious medical decisions on the basis of dubious tests. Uh, many stories emerged of people receiving diagnoses for conditions that they simply did not have, which bewildered medical professionals and frightened patients. But for the employees inside Theranos, some of them had seen enough, which brings us to the real story of tonight, the story of two courageous individuals, Erica Chung and Tyler Schultz, who in their very first jobs after college risked their personal and professional lives to stand for what is right. As we hear and learn from their experiences this evening, they will surely serve as an important reminder to us all for what happens when myth is mistaken from reality and when values are divorced from technology. And interviewing our two guests tonight with questions from many of you in the audience will be Sasank Munakutla, an undergraduate here at Stanford and member of the student group CS Plus Social Good. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Erica, Tyler, and Sasank to the stage. Well, Erica and Tyler, on behalf of the Stanford community, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks um, for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. There certainly has been a lot of excitement around campus to hear from you. Now, Alexander earlier mentioned um, that Elizabeth Holmes sat here right in your chair in Semex <laughs> Auditorium not too long ago. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Um, considering the seat she was sitting in today, I hope the trend stops here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a bit surreal, honestly. Like, uh, you never would have expected by joining Theranos that this is what would have happened. I never expected that, you know, I'd enter into a company that ended up being a big fraud case. So, yeah, it's a bit surreal. As a student myself, and a lot of us in the audience today are students, I would like you to think back to college. What were your experiences like, and what drew you to Theranos as your first real job after college? Do we want me to go with this one? Okay. Um, yeah, so I, a little bit of background. I studied molecular and cell biology and uh, linguistics, and I was on the academic track. So I was trying to see about getting a PhD after college, but had kind of become a little disillusioned with academia and uh, fell in love with like the vision of Theranos, that it was like getting research that was in a lab and making it into a commercialized product. Um, and was super sold on the vision, totally drank the Kool-Aid initially, uh, you know, making healthcare more accessible and affordable um, was kind of right up my alley. And how cool would it be to work for a tech company in the Silicon Valley, right? The place to be for technology. So that kind of drew me to Theranos. And also Elizabeth Holmes drew me to Theranos from the little that I had read on the media um, having a really strong female entrepreneur who was um, basically worked very hard to start her own company uh, was really appealing to me. And so that's why I decided to go working with Theranos. I had other, two other job opportunities actually at Stanford and UCSF, but I turned them both down to, <laughs> to work for Theranos. So. Yeah. Um, so when I started working at Theranos, that was after my junior year of college actually. So. I was a junior at Stanford, uh, majoring in mechanical engineering, and then I actually met Elizabeth Holmes, and I totally fell in love with her vision and changed my major to biology so I could do some more chemistry. And um, yeah, I was only a bio major for two quarters, but I ended up graduating, graduating biology and then going to Theranos. Could you tell us more about both of your roles at Theranos? What did your work entail? Uh, so I started out in protein engineering, so I was developing antibodies that would be used in the tests, but four days after I started doing that job full-time, they actually shut down all the research labs <laughs> and put us all into what was called the assay validation team. Yeah. Um, and the reason that I was told was that that team was like 20 people and then dropped down to like eight people super quickly because they were working you know, through the night. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, so then I moved into assay validation, uh, where our goal was really to take a test and make sure that it was safe to use, you know, on, on the general public. Yeah, uh, so I started off in research and development, and that's where Tyler and I actually met, so I was on the assay validation team as well. Um, 
And as I started working with the company, they also did the same thing where they're like, actually the clinical lab needs a lot of help, so we're gonna change your job role and you're gonna work in the clinical lab. So I was in charge of taking Theranos' proprietary devices that we were validating in research and development and then integrating it into the clinical lab. And the clinical lab, just to give everyone context, is where you process patient samples. So that's regulated by the Center of Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medi-Cal Ser Services, am I saying that right? And, uh, and the FDA. Sure. Um, I think it was nice to hear from you that, you know, you were often moved between different teams. Other people described a culture of fear at the company. Entire divisions and teams were siloed away from each other with no communication between them. I'd love to hear more about that culture of fear at Theranos and what that meant for both of you personally. Yeah, so there would be like, uh, like barriers up that would surround where the <laughs> devices were. So even if you were in the lab, you still couldn't see the devices. So mm -hmm. like I worked there for three months uh, and didn't see a single device. Um, it wasn't until I moved uh, into the assay validation team that I actually saw a device for the first time. And it's kind of crazy to think that you have like most of your company working towards something that they've never even seen. Um, and that's how siloed it was. Um, but I remember there was one funny, one funny thing that happened where like a, a light bulb went out. So they had like an electrician come in and he stands on this like 12 foot ladder and puts in the light bulb where he can see over all of the barriers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I saw that happening and I just thought, I feel like those barriers are there, like, really for, I don't know. It felt yeah. weird that they didn't care about the, like, like, someone from the outside scene. It seemed like it was a barrier to, like, make us, like, the employees realize um, that they weren't supposed to, to know things. It was also for the vendors, too. I would talk to, we had these machines called T-cans. They were these robotic liquid handling arms. And they'd find it so ridiculous. Because the moment you entered into Theranos, the first thing that they have you do is sign an NDA and sign like the sort of, like if you do see anything, you are not allowed to disclose what you see inside there. And this was for vendors, new employees. Um, and by the time you were an employee, you've already signed a contract that you cannot disclose anything uh, that you've seen within those, those halls. Yeah. But yeah, there were all these weird man-built <laughs> obstructions, sometimes they'd be escorted all throughout the building with like two security guards to make sure that they didn't see anything. I actually remember that when I first started, there was a list of words they gave me that I was not allowed to say when describing my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't remember exactly what was on the list, but it was like pipette research, <laughs> biology. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> And you couldn't put it on LinkedIn, you couldn't put it on anything, which was funny because when all this stuff blew up, we had to say we were a part of a private biotech company. So you almost always knew that someone worked at Theranos because they probably had private biotech company on their <laughs> LinkedIn profile. Um, um, but then they had a really intense work culture as well. Like Sunny, the president of the company, would walk through the labs like three in the morning to make sure people were there working. Um, yeah, yeah. just very intense place. Yeah, and a lot of people were scared of losing their jobs. You know, these people had families that they needed to support and feed, and so constantly feeling the pressure of needing to make Sonny and Elizabeth happy and produce whatever results that they needed to kind of further whatever initiatives that they <laughs> seemed to have come up with those days. There was a lot of pressure to perform and provide the, the results that they needed. Uh, and we had a lot of members of the team who weren't necessarily U.S. citizens too. They were sponsored. They were scared that if they stopped working for Theranos, they would no longer have a visa. Um, but there was a lot of pressure to get the results specifically that Sonny and Elizabeth wanted at, at any cost. And really a sentiment that if you didn't produce, say, if you didn't get this assay validated and say that, you know, vitamin D is getting the perfectly accurate results, there was something wrong with you. There was nothing wrong with the technology, nothing wrong with uh, you know, the chemistry. It was like you were not performing well and you weren't getting this done, um, was generally the, the culture. Both of you discovered troubling results of various forms despite this culture of fear and managed to think through of those results on your own. What exactly did you find and how did you go about finding those troubling results? Yeah. I think oh, we were talking about this backstage about when I started working for Theranos, it must have been like two months in, 
where I was really struggling with when did two plus two equal six? Because this has never been a fact ever <laughs> in, my, in all of my education. Um, but there were simple things. In research and development, we were watching people basically tamper with data. They were cherry picking results. This is like fundamentals of scientific integrity. You show all the data. Even if it doesn't show the accuracy you want, the CVs you want, you keep it in there. And that provides you with the information to know I'm doing something wrong. But instead of taking those as signals of I'm doing something wrong, people would want to alter it to get better accuracy rates, to get better CVs. And so that was the first kind of like, what is going on here? I've never been in a laboratory where this has happened. Uh, and then for me, because I had gone from research and development, research and development, you know things are gonna go wrong. That's kind of your job is to fix the problems of what's going on. But then going into the clinical lab and taking what I'd seen not work and, and just constantly being falsified and then putting it in a clinical setting where now I was having to test patients. And I was basically using these same tests that I saw not working in a research setting on patients um, started to raise even more red flags. In addition to watching inspectors come in and you know, Sonny and Elizabeth not showing them the actual technology we were using on patients and all these things. I'd only worked there to give her for seven months, right? So it was pretty quick, like probably about a month and a half in that I started seeing like something's not right here. Um, but yeah, those were some of the instances. So for me, my first red flag was the first time that I saw what they called the open reader. So they had <laughs> one reader where they didn't have a shell on it, so you could actually see what the protocol was doing in inside. So when I first joined the assay validation team, they showed me and um, a senior scientist, like my, uh, my boss from the, engineering, from the protein engineering lab, we saw it at the same time. And um, you can immediately tell that nothing in there is, is new. So yeah. the senior scientist looked at the person who was demoing the device and said, do you think this is very cool? And then the woman who's giving the demo just went, I'll let, I'll let you decide for yourself if you think this is cool, and walked away. And at that point, I, like, I kind of realized that it was this like, open secret that it wasn't real. Um, and then I started working with the devices and going to these daily meetings where we would go over the data from the day before. And you quickly fall into the habit of just deleting experiments that don't look good, even just parts of experiments that don't look good. We would go through the meeting and go, oh, that looks weird. Let's rerun those. Let's rerun. Everything was, okay, what do we need to rerun? And we just rerun it. So, so you delete it repeat, uh, and repeat it, fill in the data with the, new, with the newly collected data. Um, and then for me, a big red flag, probably the biggest red flag was when we were doing this for the syphilis test. And I was doing what they called precision testing. So I ran the same sample over and over to see how much variation there was. And I found that at our cutoff level, there was a 43% coefficient of variation. So the standard deviation was 43% of the expected value, or the mean, which is enormous. <laughs> um, and then we ran samples that were known to be positive for syphilis. And the first time we did that, we only got 65% correct. So we said, OK, that's not good. Let's try that again. And then we got 80% correct. Um, and then we did this other test called finger stick versus Venus, where we would actually collect samples from within Theranos, from our own, from ourselves and from our coworkers. We would get the finger prick, we would get the Venus draw, we would test them both and compare the results to make sure that you, know, you could actually do a finger prick for this. And a ton of us tested positive for syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the manager of our lab just going, guys, it's not impossible. <laughs> and I, like, uh, I guess it's not impossible, but if yeah. it's plausible, then we should maybe send out like a company-wide email or yeah. <laughs> something. But obviously, no one, no one took that seriously. So yeah. um, that was a huge red flag. Um, yeah, the syphilis test was definitely, for me, like the big, the big kind of like wake-up call. Yeah. And after reporting these troubling results, um, you voiced, after recording these troubling results, both of you voiced your concerns, which led to threats of various sorts. Tyler, at your worst, it was reported you were followed by private investigators. You had lawyers showing up to your grandfather's house unannounced on what was a friendly visit. Erica, you had an individual follow you to your new workplace, um, who even knew your temporary home address, which even your mom wasn't aware of. 
Um, how did you handle that type of pressure, and how did you handle the threats um, when you reported your concerns? Oh, I did <laughs> a lot of running because I was so paranoid and freaked out. Um, yeah, it was it was a really tough process. I hadn't expected them to quite go to that degree. So, um, essentially. After we had reported, I had been getting calls from Theranos and had chose, okay, I'm not going to engage with these people because I don't owe them anything. There's no reason to engage with them. And, and after that, uh, they had showed up at my workplace. So I was working late. My coworkers had come up to me and they said, Erica, there's been someone who's been sitting outside all day. We don't feel comfortable for you to just go alone into your car. We're going to walk you to your car. And... They walk me to my car, this man comes up to me and he hands me this letter, and I look at the letter and I see it, and it was for an address for a temporary home I was staying. I was in between houses, and so I was staying with my coworker, Julia, and I was completely freaked out because no one had known this address. No one knew I was living in this place. I was technically only staying in this place Monday through Friday, and then every weekend I'd go to LA or and see my family and move stuff. Um, and completely panicked. And actually, uh, it was a bit weird because Tyler and I were going through similar experiences but actually had to silo from one another. And I had made up this, because I thought I was being followed. Tyler, I think, was also being paranoid about who was followed. I had this lamp that I said I'd give him. So I just like randomly had this lamp in my house hand, showed up at his house and pretended that the reason I was there was to give him this lamp. And then we went into this like backwood area to talk to each other to just check in and like, what is going on? <laughs> what is going on? Like, I yeah. am absolutely terrified right now. I don't feel comfortable talking to anyone. Like at this point, you know, I think I'm, I was 23, right? I have no money to my name, thinking that I'm gonna have to hire a lawyer and not knowing how much that's gonna cost me. Um, and, it, and, and I'm being followed, right? People are taking the extreme of, of following me places, so. Yeah, actually, I think really Erica, we had like a, an extra room, and Erica was supposed to stay in that extra room for a little while, and she said she could bring me a lamp because I had no light in my room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> literally no light. Um, and then I just started ignoring her. She would text me, yeah. she would message me on Facebook, and I just stopped talking to her, hoping she would like, get the hint or something. Which I did. <laughs> but then I was actually in my driveway and I saw her driving down our, into our driveway and I remember thinking, oh no. Because um, we weren't, I wasn't supposed to be talking to anyone from Theranos anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but then I obviously really wanted to talk to Erica so I didn't send her away. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then I remember we went inside and I was like, ah, actually let's go back outside. And we went into this like random place. I was living out in Los Altos Hills so we went like down into the bushes um, <laughs> yeah. because we knew someone was following us and like, yeah. I don't know, I was, I don't know, we were just, I had I a burner phone that. for like over a year because I was scared my phone was being tapped and maybe that was me being very, very paranoid but that's, again, back to that statement of culture of fear, um, just the amount of secrecy, signing the NDAs, the retaliation of coming after employees, this is how paranoid a lot of us were. We, like, I, yeah, I had a, a fake phone for over a year, and if yep. I wanted to discuss anything, like, I never said the word Theranos. It was, like, you know, the, like, forbidden word for a long time, especially near any of my phone communication, because I was, I was so nervous about the potential consequences of what that, that could have. I had a burner phone, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With all these threats, intimidation, tactics, how did you still find the courage? Was there ever a thought of just remaining silent and just moving on, perhaps like some of the other employees at the company? Um, well, I think at that point it was too late. You know, by the time we were getting kind of bullied around, it was the decision had been made. Um, I at least had no idea what I was getting into when I got into it. Um, so yeah. I, I, I mean, I had no idea what was coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but once I was in it, there was, I was, there was no question in my mind that I was about being right. I knew I was right. Um, there was, I was not going to give in. There was no way I was so stubborn. Yeah. There was no way I was going to say I was wrong when I knew I was right. Mm -hmm. No chance.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a different experience than Tyler. We were talking about this. Like, I really felt uh, there's this term that I just learned called gaslighting. And it's where you make someone believe that they are the crazy one. And you'll use these different manipulation tactics to make someone believe that. And really, at Theranos, I thought I was missing something, that I didn't have enough information. The fact that I was with people who were PhDs from MIT, that we had huge teams of people working on this project. We were almost like 200, 300 employees. Me being 22 and come fresh graduate out of college, like I just was missing something. And for me, it wasn't until, I knew there was a lot of messed up things going on, and frankly, I'm just not one of those people who can kind of keep quiet. Like, I'm just gonna tell you like, yeah, this is wrong. Like, I don't know what they're doing, but you know, this was my experience, and I'm, uh, for better or worse, very transparent uh, about, about information in general. Um, but it, was, it wasn't until that type of retaliation that I knew, okay, they're hiding something. You know, the fact that they're going to these types of length to come after me, again, being a 22-year-old who's a fresh grad, um, there's something going on here. Like, I, you know, they're lying to patients. And honestly, because they had come after me and I had to seek the help of a lawyer, I was able to have a conversation with them about how do I report this to a regulatory agency? What does it mean to be a whistleblower? What are the next steps to make sure that they stop processing patient samples? Because you know, at this point, I know and I'm certain that they're trying to cover something up. Um, and so in, in a weird way, it kind of backfired on me that they retaliated. But then it, get, it empowered me with the information I needed to know to say, I know how I can tell Clea everything they need to know to where they can do this inspection and actually find out, are they um, testing patients the way that's appropriate? And come to find out, it wasn't. And, and Clea shut them down, which was um, ultimately what I wanted in the end. I wanted them <laughs> not to li not have them lie to patients anymore. Yeah. On the note of intense retaliation, my next question is for you specifically, Tyler. The Wall Street Journal reported that you'd incurred over $400,000 in legal fees and that your parents almost had to sell their house to defend you. Um, your grandfather was also on the board of Theranos. How did you handle this type of pressure, especially knowing that family was involved? Um, I mean, it definitely was not easy. Um, so at, at that time, uh, I mean, my lawyers told me that the only people I can talk to are my wife, my lawyers and my priest, and I'm not religious and I'm not married. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the only person I can talk to is, are my lawyers, and that is an extremely expensive therapy session. So <laughs> I wasn't talking to anybody, um, and it was really weird for me to be disconnected from my parents. You know, my parents obviously knew crazy things were happening, but they didn't know what the details were. Um, but the only source of information that they were getting was actually from my grandfather, which is ultimately, um, he was kind of like a, a microphone for Elizabeth. So Elizabeth could talk to my parents, but I couldn't talk to my parents. It was kind of how it seemed. Um, so they were kind of under the impression that I was, being, I was the crazy one. They were told that 80% of what the Wall Street Journal came only from me, um, that I was being unreasonable in our negotiations to try to settle things. Um, so we had a tough conversation where they said, you know, the next opportunity you have to sign something, just sign it um, and end this. This is not your fight anymore. You've done enough. Um, and, you know, they said, we will support you no matter what, and we will sell our house to keep paying for your legal fees, but please just end it. Um, but I didn't do that. I let it keep going, racked up a huge... A huge bill, but um, my parents were awesome the entire time. Luckily, it ended. Luckily, they stopped bothering me before it came to the point where they had to sell their house. Um, but yeah, it was a huge, huge bill at the end of the day. But it's funny because for me, um, it ended up being I kind of saw money as like runway, and I had really no emotional attachment to it. I saw it as like, okay, I can put up a fight for this long, so. I need to, you know, figure out, be, you know, obviously be, um, be smart, but, um, you know, fight. This is how long I can, I can put up a fight. I didn't have, like, an emotional attachment to, oh, no, I'm losing 
hundreds of thousands of dollars as this goes on. Um, and I think that just goes back to how stubborn I was and how, how convicted I was in, in knowing that I was right. Sure. I would like to reflect now more on the board of Theranos. The board of Theranos um, included secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, generals, a lot of other big names and influential people. Would you say that these individuals, would you hold them guilty or culpable in any way? Or would you feel they were totally unaware, just placeholders, really? I mean, it, it's one of those things when you come in as an investor, um, I, I guess this is a good warning sign to investors, hey, do your due diligence, right? If you don't know anything about medical diagnostics, maybe you should bring someone in to kind of research what <laughs> the product is and the people behind it and, and what's kind of going on here. I think in the case of Theranos and what we saw by the SEC filings and everything, they were feeding their investors a lot of false information. So how would in, in, you know, the board of directors members know what the extent of which was going on if you know, Sun, Sunny and Elizabeth were lying to their board members about what was happening? Um, I think they strategically decided to choose board members that didn't have a medical background, that didn't have a biotechnology background, so they were able to um, not have people that would investigate very deeply in kind of the technology and what was going on. Um, whether they should be held accountable or not, it's, it's hard to say, right? Because you don't know what those conversations were. I, I highly doubt uh, all of these people would have invested in this company and continued um, their commitment to the company, which many of them didn't, you know, as, as more information was getting exposed, if they had known what was actually going on. Yeah, yeah it's hard to know. I mean, I think the board, the board was negligent at best. So I think there is some responsibility there. And I think any time you give someone a check for over $100 million, you are giving that person an incredible amount of power. And you should, you should do more due diligence. I think there is a, a, a complete lack of due diligence that is just astounding. Yeah. And we were talking about this, like it was kind of like an echo chamber where it's like you get that one guy that you have a lot of respect for who then gets like one other guy who they have a lot of respect for. And then you have, you know, Elizabeth basically convincing both of them that they're great. And then they're telling each other how great Elizabeth is, but it's all fed from the information of this one person. And then it just kind of yeah, gets, it echoes around. It and echoes then, around. And then and even if you do bring in, you know, one more person, it's like, okay, you, you expect this one person to tell secretaries of state, defense, you know, <laughs> that they're all wrong. <laughs> No, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not gonna happen. Especially if you, I mean, yeah, if they're like your friend or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Like Henry Kissinger brought in this surgeon from New York who he says is the smartest man in the world. So obviously they're good friends. Um, <laughs> of course he's just gonna, like, I don't know. He, apparently he like did due diligence or whatever and said it was all good, but you know, I don't know. What, how honest is he really gonna be with all these people? <laughs> I'd like to explore the theme of accountability a bit more, especially with the employees. Now, many employees at Theranos stayed silent despite knowing that the claims made in the media were obviously false and knowing that patients were at risk. On their perspective, they were arguably silenced by intense pressure from Theranos, including the threat of heavy litigation, intimidation tactics, as, as you've earlier mentioned. Would you hold your fellow employees who stayed silent culpable or guilty in any way? This is super hard, right? This I definitely do not. Yeah, I don't either, but. Um, I mean, it was a really tough situation. Um, like, if I could go back and give myself my advice, I would probably tell myself not to do anything. Like, that would be my advice. Like, you're going to pay a huge, huge price for this. Someone will figure it out anyway. Don't do it. Knowing myself, I would have ignored that advice and done it anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. But. <laughs> Um, but I, I don't think any less of my coworkers who didn't do what I did. Yeah, it's really complicated, right? Because these people, again, they have families, they have, 
okay, there, there are several different things. So Theranos was a big organization. So if you're a software developer just doing the interface for how the machines work, you're not really gonna know what's going on with the patient processing. So there are a lot of employees that were just very ignorant to what was actually going on. One, because of the way that the structure of the company was worked, there were physical barriers blocking people. There was card key access where some people couldn't get in and others could. Um, so, so it makes it really hard for a lot of even the internal employees going like within the company to know what's going on. And then the people working in a clinical setting, like an example is we had clinical lab scientists that typically would work in hospitals. They do all the patient processing. For us in the clinical lab, a clinical lab scientist could not see what was going on with the Edison's and the Theranos proprietary devices until they could be trusted. So we had CLSs that were on board, but they were stuck in a separate room and not to see the actual machines that we were using to test the patients. So there were definitely a lot of processes like this that like the own staff and employees were guarded from seeing what's going on. Um, you know, even in my case, I didn't end up reporting to the Center of Medicaid and Medi-Cal Services until I talked to a lawyer. Like, never in my life would I have anticipated that I was going to have to report a company to a regulatory agency. There is nothing in life that prepares you for that experience at all. There's just, like, no school class, nothing. No one anticipates having to do this. Um, and so even that first step of engagement is really hard to figure out. Like, for me, I... How, how do you find the number to, for the Center of Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal Services <laughs> with the specific domain of lab diagnostics, right? Like just even finding that phone number is actually quite hard. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, no one is really prepared for these types of instances of, of, of what to do. And it really took, I think, the specific experiences that, you know, I had at least, I can speak for myself, um, to, to know what to do, and that empowered me to sort of make the decision to, to come forward. I'd now like to move on to a broader reflection, I guess, of Silicon Valley on the whole. Now, many people associate Silicon Valley, of course, with um, limitless innovation, pioneering novel technology, but there has been pushback against its reckless culture. Vaporware, the public marketing of technology that is yet to be fully re realized, is perhaps the worst result of this. Um, so do you think there's a broader problem with Silicon Valley culture of which Theranos and Facebook are just symptoms of? Um, so after Theranos, I actually started my own company and I was part of the, the Stanford Stardex incubator. And overall, I would say, you know, almost every single person in there is just a really passionate person. And they're not, I mean, I don't think anyone in that incubator at least is selling vaporware. Um, so in my experience, I would say no. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's a. It's a huge problem. I. I generally think that most entrepreneurs are just really passionate, smart people. Yeah. I think the problem here isn't necessarily saying, okay, I want to build this product. I need capital to do that, and, you know, this is my idea, and this is like the the you know minimal viable product that I have, and here are my plans. Can you give me the capital to sort of build this? Right, and that's, that's very normal. That process is very normal. I think the like, greater problem here is, is uh, lying and, and sort of being delusional. And this, this happens across the board. You know, in the case, like, you know, not disclosing to someone, uh, not disclosing to your investors that, you know, I am launching a product that's not ready on patients that, that's a problem, right? Like that's a that's a severe problem. Um, I, I think it, it, it's hard to say. Like we were talking about the software model. So in software, you have this instance where you iterate constantly. Like what makes a good technology product is the fact that you can you know kind of throw something out there, see how people respond based on what the better response rate is. You curtail to the next thing, and I think. At Theranos, they were trying to take the same software model, but with medical diagnostics. And you can't do that, right? You can't decide, okay, I'm gonna launch this product, sacrifice six patients, uh, you know, see if like some responded well, then I can 
move you know, in this other direction to sort of iterate and improve on these medical diagnostics. It's just really, it's, it's a different industry, it's a different field, and it's not something that you, know, you can just test on a few users here and then kind of change what the, 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 the product looks like. It's, it's, it's a very different, um, it's just a very different industry. You just can't do that in healthcare. Do you think that there should be any alternative cultures that should try to be fostered, or would you, or do you believe that it's fine to segregate, keep software as it is, or would you want to hope to do any? You, would you hope for any alternative culture and hope that that would maybe inspire the other industries to have to be less reckless, perhaps? Yeah, like just be honest, you know, just be honest, just be transparent. Uh, be transparent and honest with your customers and with your investors and just say like, look, this is where we're at. Uh, and, and you know, these are, be passionate still about what the possibilities of them, some things are, but be realistic in like what can yeah. actually be, be reality yeah. versus. Yeah, you gotta be um, clear about what is vision. Yeah. What's the vision and what is reality. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, entrepreneurs are definitely responsible for selling the vision, so. I guess sometimes it's easy to get like too caught up in selling your vision and you start pretending like it's real. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, I don't think it happens. I don't know. In my experience, know. I haven't seen that happen too, too often. Uh, I see it a lot. Uh, I'm on the, I see it all the time. Especially, uh, yeah, I see it all the time. In Hong Kong, ICOs have been very big and just watching people uh, now raise money in a very unregulated way. I've seen people say, oh yeah, I have this great like electronic medical record system. You know, it's gonna leverage AI to be able to do pre predictive diagnostics. And you ask them the simple question, hey, let me, can I see your product? Can I see a product demo? And it's a Google form. Like that's all it is. And you're like. What? But they still showed you the Google form. And they still showed <laughs> me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like, look, you can input your name. I'm like, oh, no, great. <laughs> great. Um, Elizabeth would have said proprietary. Proprietary, yeah, exactly. That was, that was the scope, proprietary. Sorry, I cannot disclose this. Um, yeah, I, I, I think now coming from an investment perspective, it's like, just be honest, just be transparent. Like, people want these things to succeed, especially the vision like Theranos, right? Making. Uh, diagnostics uh, cheaper to produce, more affordable. You wouldn't even need insurance to be able to get these tests done. Like, who wouldn't want to support a project like that? If you're honest with me and tell me, like, look, this is our vision. This is what we want to do. This is where we're at. You know, we anticipate. You know, we need to hit these milestones by this point. You know, this is our plan. This is our strategy. I'm more than willing to give you cash. Many investors are more than willing to give you cash in order to. Uh, have that come into fruition, but don't don't lie about it. Don't uh, falsify data. Don't um, falsify how much revenue you're making. All these things. It's like really just just being honest. It's such a simple thing. It's it's almost hard to say that we <laughs> that's an alternative culture. Um, you know, uh, yeah. On those values of honesty and transparency, um, what do you think should be the role of educational institutions such as here at Stanford in preparing young graduates to navigate ethical challenges in their careers? You got anyone with this one? Um, I don't know. I think it would be really, really tough. I don't think I could have taken a class that prepared me for this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's in probably most important to just be introspective about the about your own experiences. Like, after this happened to me, I've had tons of people come tell me that say, oh, I've experienced something very similar, obviously not on the same magnitude, but very similar situation. Like, so many people have said that, and I think probably everyone in this room has an experience that's somewhat similar and they can relate, at least to some degree. So I think even better than a class is just to like be aware when these types of situations happen and check in with yourself and see like what did you do, what maybe should you have not done, or what could you have done better, and um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah. I think it'd be hard to have a class that prepares you. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be good to know that like whistleblower laws exist, because I didn't know that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah. If you go down the right channels, you actually have a lot of protections as a whistleblower. So it's good to know those channels. Yeah, I, 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 after this all happened, I've been getting a lot of feedback from people that say the same thing, whether you work for the NHS or whether you're in academia or you're working for a biotech company, a lot of people are like, hey, I'm seeing kind of shady stuff going on in my workplace and you know, I, I want to do something about it, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, and, you know, I, I feel bad because people feel that because I was in that position, I will know what to do, but I have no idea how you would report, you know, something to the NHS or anything. Uh, even in academia, I don't know how to go through that process. I think we're at an interesting time where, you know, I, we were talking about this with Theranos in, and in my case, like, I had a lot of doubts whether, you know, what was going on was, again, uh, like, I had a lot of doubts about my own knowledge about the regulatory landscape. But what I was able to do, do was go on the internet, stay up at 3 in the morning, and like, no, I, this, is, this is not the law. They keep telling me that this is a law, but it's not. Um, so I think for a lot of people, knowing that, you know, there's a lot of resources that you can access. If you have a question, you can go on the internet. You can potentially talk to free lawyers. You can go and talk to people about certain concerns that you have, and they'll probably be able to tell you what the next steps are. Um, and if you're, I, you know, another big thing is if you're getting retaliation from people, uh, you know, learning how to have the mental fortitude to be resilient is really, really important. Um, and to kind of, you know, stick to integrity, you know, saying to yourself, like for me, it was like, I made the commitment by going into healthcare to make sure that I protected the patients that I served. And holding on to that simple line and that simple fact really carried forward all of my actions. Like this is, this is the commitment that you made by going into this industry that you needed to protect patients. Um, I don't, yeah, it's hard to formulate like a class or anything, but depending on what side you're coming from. Like, know you have access to resources now. We live in a beautiful time where you can type anything in, you know, to a search engine to figure out the right person to talk to or the right resources to go to. Um, if you are getting retaliation from your employees, just like, take a moment, breathe, try and stay resilient through the process. And um, uh, I think those are the two, two biggest things that I learned. How you can put that in a class, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, honestly, having discussions like this is probably very valuable too, because many, you know, especially with technology in general, um, whether it's big data and AI, synthetic biology and genetic engineering, we're gonna have a lot of these discussions kind of coming up where we don't know how to handle new technologies anymore. It's something that we haven't experienced and we don't know the consequences necessarily of what they'll have when they get implemented into societies, so. What advice would you have for students or new graduates when looking at potential job offers, internship of offers to gauge for integrity and ethical environments? Both of you mentioned you had multiple job offers. Do you think there are certain questions you would have asked retrospectively or any red flags you wish you had noticed perhaps in an interview setting? Uh. In retrospect, I would, I would never work for another stealth company again. There's just no way I could, there's no way I would step back yeah. into a stealth company, you know? I mean, that might be swinging too far. I'm sure there are plenty of stealth companies that are fine, but like, mm -hmm. at least just me personally, like I wanna be able to go do a job and then be able to tell my friends and family what I'm doing. Yeah, having to sign an NDA before you go into a job interview is probably like, hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> this is just a job interview. I haven't started working for you. What's going on here? Um, I think just like with anything, just ask questions. Do your due diligence. Like what I've realized with working is like you're going to spend at least 40 hours a week doing this thing. More likely more because you drive and you get there. Like asking people a lot of questions on, you know, what are your values? If people have left the company, talking to previous employees, what was their experience? I think alone at Theranos, if we had just talked to previous employees, that yeah. would have like set That's the like record the straight. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would have really set the record straight quite fast. We would have realized like just the horrible, horrible experiences that so many people had 
that preceded us. Yeah, actually um, a good question would be uh, like how many people have quit in the last yeah. four months? Yep, that's one of If it's like 20% of your company, then yeah. like. And Probably, if they say the other issue too with us, like anytime you would ask uh, Elizabeth a question, it would always be, "I'm sorry, I can't disclose that. That's confidential information." So that's probably another thing where you're like, "Hmm, okay, like, is this warranted secrecy or not?" Um, but it's it's yeah, just do your due diligence. Ask a lot of questions. Talk to former employees. That would have probably been the most illuminating is just to talk to former employees. On the other turn, as a startup founder, this, my next question is sourced from a member of the audience. Um, how should young startup founders work to establish integrity and an ethical environment, especially in fields like healthcare? Um, just be honest. Yeah, yeah, well, just. I think it just, it's going to take a long time. Yeah. Um, so start building a track record as early as you can. I read a, a good article actually with the Stanford um, Business School. They were talking about how in business you tend to create metrics for your shareholders. So you're constantly focused on things like ROI. And maybe it's much better if we start thinking about who are our actual stakeholders. So in the case of you know, uh, healthcare, like what are the things that would make this product or service successful for my patients? and really examining the business in a more holistic way, where we're, you know, maybe we need to design the way that we examine a company, not solely by the revenue it's generating and the profits it's making, but also about what are its consequences for society? What are its consequences for, you know, the hospitals it serve, the patients it serves, the potentially even the insurance providers that it has, um, and to, you know, not solely focus on the bottom line. And my final question, um, I would like to hear more about where your careers are now and how this whole experience of being a whistleblower has impacted your careers. Has it, do people view it favorably? Are there, is there anyone you've interacted with who views your tag as a whistleblower cautiously? I'd love to hear about the reflections on your life after this experience. Uh, for me, it's only been positive, yeah. Um, and it's kind of weird because I think in most whistleblower situations, the whistleblower has a really hard time kind of getting their life back on track. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like the exact opposite. Like after the Wall Street Journal article um, like said who I was, I was getting job offers from venture capital firms, <laughs> from, from big biotech companies, from small startups, from research institutions, like really the whole gamut. I was getting emails of people saying, hey, love what you did, come work for us. Yeah. And I think that's actually really rare in these types of situations. And I honestly don't know what's different about my situation than other whistleblowers. Yeah. I had a similar, it was overall, it was very, very positive. I think the thing you never know, and Tyler, I think you actually said this to me, you never, no one who has a problem with it or who thinks it's a bad thing will tell you. So you really don't know what the consequences of it are going to be until you're in a room with a VC and then they get confronted by, you know, they, they say, oh, you were the whistleblower of Theranos, okay, get out of my room, potentially. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because you really can't predict when that would happen, but I feel like the people that had a problem with it are not gonna tell you. The people, of course, who, who uh, you know, admire what you did, they'll be very communicative about, about that process. Um, it's been really interesting now, so since I left Theranos, I, I now work for a tech accelerator in Hong Kong, so we invest in early stage startup companies. And now, going outside of working for a startup, building the product, knowing the grind and the hustle of like, how do I get this thing to work? How do I get people to actually want what I'm making? Um, and now sitting on how do I evaluate a company and, um, it, it, you know, is this a good investment or not? Uh, it's made me much more skeptical with those investment decisions. Like, it's just the simple thing of just asking people for a product demo. You would think it would be the like first thing you would want to see, but so many investors fail to do that to actually just sit and dig into the product. Um, yeah, this is definitely, you know, kind of 
made me, I think, a much better investor and doing much more, uh, much better due diligence on the companies now that we support. Um, I'm hoping that this won't hurt my career in the future, but honestly, you, you don't know kind of when something will come back to bite you until it does. I have one kind of funny anecdote. So I was asked to uh, like call into a, a business school class at Yale. Um, so I did that, but the professor didn't announce to the class that I was on the line yet. And he asked, does anyone think that Tyler Schultz did the wrong thing? One person raised their hand, and he called on her. And he, and she, he said, he's on the phone right now. Do you want to tell him why? <laughs> <laughs> and she went, no. <laughs> I'm like, come on, trust me, I can take it. <laughs> but I didn't, she didn't speak up. <laughs> yeah. But there are people out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's been incredibly inspiring to hear from both of you, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Stanford community for being so candid and sharing your insights. Um, I think students can certainly look up to you as role models on how to stay true to your core values, even under intense adversity. Um, it's been my deep pleasure to moderate this discussion. For the next segment, I'd like to invite Colin, who will moderate a Q&A uh, from the audience now. So why don't we start with the gentleman with the Yale shirt on, right here. Um, is this on? Yeah, cool. Uh, well, first, um, you, you guys made enormous sacrifices and, and showed incredible bravery, so thank you for that, um, first of all. Uh, and, and secondly, you know, so I read Bad Blood, and one of the things that I've been trying to wrap my head around that I still don't quite understand is just the psychology of it. You know, and I mean, obviously, you, you, you guys aren't inside uh, Elizabeth's and, and Sonny's head, but can, can you help me understand like what the deal is with Sonny Balwani? Because it's like you know he sort of lurks, he sort of lurks in this bad blood story, and it's never really clear. You know, is he like the puppet master behind the scenes, or like you know, Carrie Rue came and gave a talk here, and you know, he sort of said he's this you know oblivious guy, whatever. Like, and I, I don't know, that didn't quite make sense to me. I'm just trying to to figure it out and wrap my head around. It. It's this weird, dark, fascinating story that doesn't quite make sense, and so would love to. Sort of yeah. hear your guys' thoughts on that. Uh, so I would say that Sonny Balwani has the personality of gravel. <laughs> this is like this grumbly, I don't know, grumbly guy, just like very rough around the edges. Um, I didn't interact with him all that much, um, but probably the most pleasant conversation I ever had with him was he was telling me about how he knows a lot of cops and they tell him when they're not patrolling 280 so he can go drive his cars really fast. <laughs> um, but I didn't, like, I really didn't interact with him all that much, but he would like walk through the labs at three in the morning and you know, not really say anything, just walk through and walk back out. Yeah. Um, but he was definitely running the show inside Theranos, for sure. Yeah, it, uh, there were so many instances with him. It, it was funny, someone asked me the question, so like, what did you think about him? And it was clear I was trying to be very diplomatic about it. He's like, was he an asshole or was he not an asshole? I was like, total asshole, <laughs> it was like hands down. Um, but uh, yeah, he definitely was running the show with a, a lot of the things that were going on. And even uh, we did this internal proficiency testing. So proficiency testing is where you're essentially trying to check if the results you are given in third party labs uh, are you getting within the same accuracy range? And we had decided to um, essentially test it on our old machines, like the Siemens, Advia, all the other machines, uh, and the Theranos proprietary methods, because what they used to do it on was just the old machines, and we were finding that the results weren't lining up. And he sent back, first of all, he wasn't even on this email, so he just got all of our emails and we had no idea. He was like monitoring all of us and piped in about how this was the most terrible thing that we had ever done. Like how dare we use the Theranos proprietary, like the Edisons to double check whether, you know, the results were actually accurate. It was all in broken English. Like you couldn't understand what he was saying. It was just an absolute mess. Um, it was like he uh, just, 
was constantly surveillancing all the employees, was making a lot of calls and decisions without having the expertise within those domains, particularly within healthcare and a clinical laboratory. Um, People had those like dots that they put over the cameras on their computers because they thought yeah. Sonny was watching them. And same with phone calls. Like everyone knew that their phone calls were being tapped and so people would like pass. Like I remember our lab director was so paranoid about it. He would like pass me notes because he was like convinced that they were monitoring all his phone calls. And, um, and a big reason why I quit, I had, I had a few interactions with Sonny throughout the course was because I got pulled into his office and basically knew, I was like, this person's a crook. Like, I don't know what they're doing, but they're lying. They're, there's just something wrong here. I don't know what's going on, but after the conversation that I had in his office one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I quit. Uh, I called my dad, crying on the phone, like, what do I do? Uh, and I'm like, I can't work for this company anymore. I do not feel good about this. Like, I'm sorry, I know, like, I got student loans to pay, but I'm out of here. Like, I can't do this. Um, and uh, yeah, he was, he was not a good figure in the whole storyline at all. Thanks again for your honesty and for your sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman in the balcony. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. Um, my question revolves around uh, your guys' experience with regulatory agencies and with lawyers. Um, I was wondering if either of you were heading up Medi-Cal or, or the FDA or, in Erica's case, the Chinese counterpart of those, what would be a regulation you'd want to put in place to try to make sure that companies like Theranos couldn't rise to $10 billion before having whistleblowers stop them? Wow. Ooh, that's tough. Um, I feel like the systems that are in place now just need to work better. Um, like, for instance, I sent an email about the proficiency testing to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services back in 20, early 2014. And um, they referred me to, the, like, basically they referred me to the correct department. I, I contacted them. They said, okay, what's the name? They said, this is cheating. Please let us know the name of the company, what tests were run, um, what dates they were run so we can reach out to them and help them improve their methods. And I gave them all that information, and then that email just got lost in the shuffle, and nothing happened. Yeah. Um, same thing when CMS came to inspect Theranos. They weren't shown the Theranos devices. They should know that a, like a startup diagnostic company is going to have some not-off-the-shelf diagnostic product. Um, but yeah, it's they hard. didn't... <laughs> It's hard for regulators too because when they're going in, they're, regulators, are, regulators aren't there to crack down on people. That's not really what they want to do. They want to like work as a system of check and balances, but they don't anticipate that a company is just going to go to such extreme lengths to deceive them. Um, in terms of new policy that you can create, I, I, I don't even know. Like it's 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 really it's really hard to say. I think the policy the laboratory developed test loophole should be closed. Oh yeah. So there's a loophole where so people thought that this was regulated under the FDA, but it's not. It's regulated under the Center of Medicaid and Medical Services. And the way that LDTs work is that you can actually run an LDT for I think six months before you act, have to report it to CLIA. Um, the thing about Theranos, why they were a special case, is because no one anticipated that people would say for like HbA1c, right? This this test has been around forever. That someone would mess it up so bad, right? Because they, I just don't think regulators thought that with a test that's existed for like 50 years now, that you would really like shake it up so much to, to, to have that much variability and, and to have that many problems. But it's really, it's really tough to say what the, the right policy would be. It's really about funding, like making sure that these, these organizations have enough resources to be able to conduct a proper inspection. Thank you. The guest with the scar. Yeah, I'm assuming that you've both read Bad Blood, and I'm just interested if there's anything about the story or the book that you were surprised by. And then if you can speak more to how you think Elizabeth Holmes won all of these people over, because it is an impressive skill to get that many CEOs and investors behind you. And there are still people who stand behind her. So from your perspective, what it is about her personality and how she did that that 
got so many people behind her? Um, I mean, she is, she, she was extremely charismatic. Like I would go into her office and she would tell me about, um, you know, she would tell me about the vision of the company and helping third world countries. And I would, I would be so motivated to do my job. And then I would go back and I was working with a Theranos device and I'd go, wait, what just happened? <laughs> this is what we were talking about that whole time? <laughs> How did she just do that to me? Like I was working with this device every day, but in, you know, like a five minute conversation with her, she was able to change my mind and for me to feel motivated again. Yeah. So I can see how if you weren't actually working with a device every day, how, how easy it would be for her to convince you that this was real and all these things were happening. Yeah. I, I think the biggest surprise about Bad Blood was like how many people had such an like intense, crazy experience with her. Like there were so many people, so many iterations of employees that had like worked with her and just been like, oh my gosh, this is an absolute disaster. Um, and just the whole context of that, like how long that had gone on. Like we, I had entered the company about 10 years after it had been in existence. That was the biggest surprise to me. Like, whoa, this has been going on <laughs> for this long. And, and the fact that, like you said, she had convinced so many people. Part of the reason it was able to go on for so long is because the turnover of people you know, was, was so great, where she could constantly onboard new people. Um, but it was a beautiful vision, right? I think everyone is dismayed with our healthcare system, the fact that it is way too expensive, that the fact that people can't get a simple blood test without breaking the bank is just, it's just atrocious, right? Like, this is, this is just ridiculous. Um, so I think, really that vision is very easy to sell and it pulls on the heartstrings of so many people. Um, you know, people who have family members that are sick, who have been sick themselves, uh, who've financially devastated themselves because of the healthcare costs. And then also her as a person, it was really remarkable, right? We love these kinds of stories where you get this person who dropped out of Stanford she had a great idea. She worked insanely hard. It like really builds up that like American meritocracy, you know, like you can just like set your mind to any goal and if you put in the effort and the energy, you can make it happen. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, that's probably why she was able to bring so many people on board. Um, so you mentioned that it was a pretty easy transition to like going back to your careers after the whole incident was over because like you were both whistleblowers, people supported you. Um, but how do you think that the people like the head scientists who did know something was wrong for years and years and didn't speak out about it, like to your knowledge, how were they able to pick up their careers again and like have people trust them? Um, they've been fine. Like Siraj got a job and it just boggles my mind. <laughs> <laughs> There's this, yeah. this guy who is just you know, basically in on all of it. His hands were everywhere. And he just quit and went and got a job at BD. Yeah. I think fun. For me, it was weird. When I immediately quit the company, it was like a bad breakup, though. Because I really, I had, I was so committed to this project. Like, anyone who knew me working at that job, like, I really wanted it to work. And I could have seen myself working for that company pretty much for the rest of my life. Like, I really... Uh, was onboarded to the mission. And when I left, I became incredibly disillusioned. Just like, yeah, I, I completely sort of lost hope in, 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 in faith in these things. But I think for most people, there's a big disassociation between, you know, uh, what Elizabeth did and, and the employees within the organization. I think many of the employees within the organization, they're probably upset just like I was, where it was like, you know, you feel very, you, you feel lied to, you were lied to. And, and that was, it wasn't a good experience. Um, but many of them, I think, can kind of learn to grow and, and move on from that because they're like, that's, you know, she, she was kind of responsible and the, the ringmaster for a lot of, of what happened. But even Elizabeth's brother got a job fairly easily. <laughs> really? Yeah. And he knew, every, I mean, I'm sure he knew what was going on. Yeah. So, but, and that's I don't know, <laughs> people don't seem to care. Yeah. <laughs> right, and a lot, of, a lot of these end up that way, right? Like, even the guy, the Wolf of Wall Street now is like the successful life coach. And you're just like, <laughs> 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 what am I just like? 
Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question was on, um, in terms of Elizabeth Holmes' uh, personality and the way she makes statements that she makes, I think we see many other like famous figures in um, Silicon Valley, I mean, Elon Musk and many others, making these wild over-promises. And I'm wondering if you see, also see those, those parallels in terms of successful entrepreneurs in other fields that, who seem to be acting just like her, so to speak. Hmm. I think the difference between Elon Musk and Elizabeth Holmes is like, Elon Musk did deliver on, on quite a bit of things, you know? Like, yeah. you, see te you, you can't ha go on the road anymore without seeing a Tesla kind of running about. But um, uh, I, I think it, it's interesting how the Silicon Valley has been the situation, like the hero storyline has really prevailed. Where now instead of you know admiring a pop star, you now have you can admire a, a, a technology innovator, and we kind of hold these people on a certain pedestal, thinking that they're almost like gods when really they're just human like us, humans like us, and they're going to make mistakes. Um, but you know, I think the striking thing about Elizabeth was the fact that it, it just. You know, we held her to such esteem, but she wasn't producing any results for such a long time, right? Like, she just did not deliver any of the things that she had said, and she had been dishonest about so many things to so many different people, her employees, her investors, and, and uh, uh, her patients. How long has, started, or how long has um, SpaceX been a company? I'm not sure. They, hey, Anybody they launched and landed uh, their <laughs> rocket, though. They've, yeah. they've made reusable rockets. I know. That's <laughs> that was the goal, right? Wasn't that the goal? I think so, right? 2002. 2002. So that's like the same time that Theranos was founded. Yeah. And we couldn't get a machine that worked. I know. They couldn't <laughs> run a freaking glucose test. <laughs> the balcony? Hi. Um, I, first of all, I want to commend you for your uh, honesty and your uh, courage in doing what you did and coming here to talk to us is, is, a, is a real treat. Uh, one of the things I wonder about, I don't know how flat the company was in terms of management, but why do you think, I, it's easy to understand how recent graduates may not have had the experience to um, turn on the lights quicker in terms of figuring out what was going on. But uh, experienced people should have. And uh, the question I have is why your middle management people weren't the ones who actually became the whistleblowers? I don't know. So many of them had families. Know. That's the only thing that comes to my yeah. mind is just like a lot of them had families and had this sense of like, they, they didn't want to lose something, you know? They were scared, but most of them were scared of losing their jobs. A lot of them were scared of maybe even losing face um, f with being with a company that would have failed. Um, the structure of the management wasn't super flat. It was also very fragmented. Like your chemistry team didn't necessarily talk all the time with your uh, immunoassay or your infectious disease team. Um, but I think it's just, I mean, for us, it was weird how many people who were recent graduates did say something. And maybe it was a case because we had a lot less to lose yeah. in, in, in certain ways. I think it definitely helps, yeah, yeah, having less to lose. But the other thing that confuses me is that there were a lot of people that I respected who stayed at Theranos yeah. for a long time, like past when all of these stories came out. Yeah. That's confusing to me. Um, good evening, thank you. Since we're in the biz school, I figured we should have at least one sort of finance question, and that uh -oh. is uh, the sort of nine and a half billion dollar valuation was based on some amount of, of total equity raise, which I, I recall was in the eight or nine hundred million dollar range, something like that. So the question is, is where did all the money go, right? 
So <laughs> I know they had to cough up 40 million back to Walgreens, but they took in 140. And I know they paid tens of millions or maybe over $100 million to, to boys and other legal firms. Were the salaries incredibly high? Did people, were people attracted more by stock options? Were, you know, did, did Sting and Bono play at company parties? Uh, <laughs> where did it go? That's a really good question. Definitely the lawyers took a lot of it. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Elizabeth and Sonny took a lot of it as well yeah. throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, also, but, but when they fined her based on the SEC violation, they gave her some hand slap penalty, of, what was it, $500,000 yeah, or something, yep. based on what her net worth was. So I don't see that she was able to liquid, liquidate the yeah, assets. I don't think she had a very high salary. Like Someone told me her salary was like $250,000 a year, yeah. but she took out a $25 million loan from yeah. the company. Yeah. Um, so she had money in her bank account. But that still doesn't account for where all that money went. Yeah. The salaries weren't insanely high. Yeah, I mean, we did have a lot of employees. Biotech in general is pretty costly, right? You have a bunch of machinery yeah. you have to buy, even the like stock items that you have, like reagents, when you're developing these antibodies, like a small little tube of antibody can cost you like 6,000 US dollars. Yeah. Um, so the salaries, they bought a nice, pretty little office building. Yeah, Page Mill Road's not cheap. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's not that cheap. That building was. A lot. <laughs> Last question, did you ever see her blink? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know. Hi, so you talked about how your grandfather was on the board of Theranos, and I can't imagine if you ever went to him and told him, you know, like, I don't believe what's going on here, or it's kind of a scam, he would have an easy time believing you, so I'm wondering, were there people around you guys that simply had a tough time believing you, and did they ever say sorry? Um, lots of people had a hard time believing. Um. Yeah, I mean, we saw it from kind of like the back end. Like when the first paper came out, it was like when the Wall Street Journal first broke the story. You know, at this point, neither of us were on the record, and we saw it, and we saw the response of like, oh, of course, you know, they're trying to target her, it's because she's successful, they're targeting her because she's a woman. Like, you know, this is like classic tactics by the media to build another sensationalist story so they can make more money. So we definitely saw a lot of pushback on what was happening. I had even, you know, personal friends of mine who are entrepreneurs here that said, oh yeah, it's because she's a woman, that's why that they're attacking her because they're trying to, you know, just take down various women in tech. Um, so we, we kind of saw like the sentiment really shift and slam down, like kudos to John because he really stacked up those stories in a really intelligent way to make sure like the first one, I was pretty underwhelmed. I was like, oh man, like this is kind of technical. A lot of people aren't going to understand what this means. Um, but then just all the lies he was able to unravel um, and show pe people like the depth of deception that was that was occurring um, but it took a long time for like the consensus of people to realize like okay this isn't an attack on her it's really like she has just lied this much and there are just so many problems that have been occurring in this company it took a long while to to change people's sentiment in that direction the balcony so I'm actually really interested in the psychology of being in an environment where you've identified that things aren't right. But everyone around you seems to accept that it's totally normal. And it seems to me that both of you are able to be like, nope, I'm gonna trust my gut on this. But I'm curious if you have advice for people who maybe aren't able to trust themselves as well or feel like they're the ones taking crazy pills because everyone else is just business as usual. And like, how do you, how do you basically follow your gut and do what's right when it feels like you're the one who's wrong? I, I had the feeling of that I was wrong for quite quite some time. Like I really left there. I, I, I didn't know if I was wrong. I was like, no, there's, there's something wrong going on here, but maybe there is something I'm not seeing um, because you were just surrounded by so many talented people. I just couldn't, I, I really felt that uh, there was something that I wasn't seeing. I think honestly, if I had stayed within the company, 
I would have probably more likely not done something because I would have been so, it's, it's so hard to say, I have no idea. But you're so easily swayed by, again, that culture, like the fear that's sort of implemented in there and then everyone else kind of being very um, uh, just nonchalant about what was going on, just kind of going through the motions and the grind of the everyday, even though knowing that there's a lot of problems. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if I have a very I don't know. good answer. I this. never thought that I was wrong. Like, I never <laughs> had a doubt. <laughs> and, but part of it was that there were, all the senior scientists around me were seeing the same things, and I would go to them, and, and they would say, like, yep, you're, that's what you're seeing. Yeah. But it's mostly, like, it was, it's kind of weird. Like, the culture is mostly brushed off. Tons of people made jokes about it. Um, but not that many people really did anything about it. But I really never doubted that I was right. And I don't know how to tell someone who's doubting themselves to just yeah. know you're right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you would take that, that switch. I guess just, just accumulating enough evidence, right? And asking other people, like, hey, is this right? For me, it was really talking to lawyers and regulators. And then it was like, oh, OK, yeah. Um, uh, these, these intuitions that you had about what was going on um, can be easily confirmed by, by kind of experts in that field. John and Hugh. So part of what I think this makes, makes the story so fascinating is how badly it went wrong. And one of the things that makes me curious about is, do you think Elizabeth went in knowing she was going to lie and cheat her way if necessary? And if not, kind of, where do you think it went wrong? I don't think she went in this to just lie and deceive. I really think that she initially went in with good intentions. And I don't know where it went wrong. And it's so tragic to me that it went wrong and that so much money was wasted. And that now it's put this like sort of scorn around diagnostic projects where they're <laughs> not getting funded as easily. And a lot of people have a lot of skepticism around uh, like point of care diagnostics and everything. But I have no idea. I think it just, again, she just overpromised so much and just didn't know how to deliver and had so much capital that she was able to just kind of bide her time for a long time. But I really don't know. I think she just really wanted to be Steve Jobs. So she created a world where she was Steve Jobs. Um, but it does seem kind of short-sighted. Um, I think she wasn't, I think she just wasn't able to let go to admit okay, this isn't working. I just think she was just not capable of, of doing that. Yeah. And there's that very popular psychology that runs through this world that if you like just believe something hard enough that it'll come into fruition, right? We've seen Oprah and all these like successful people kind of take this, this mentality that, you know, if I just really wish it into being and I just like visualize myself being at my end goal, somehow that's just, it's just gonna work out. And I don't know, I feel like her and maybe the people she surrounded herself with kind of just like fed into that delusion for so long that they couldn't break, break out of it and just face reality of what was sitting right there in front of them. Yeah, it's kind of funny because investors want to invest in someone who says failure is not an option. But it's really, I feel like investors should tell you know, their CEOs, failure is an option. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and it's okay. I think investors have to be okay with failures. I think CEOs have to be okay with failures. Um, and she was definitely of the mindset failure is not an option, um, which is detrimental. I think we have time for one more question. Well, I guess I should, I should conclude that this failure of this question should be an option. There's a lot of pressure. Um, but thank you for coming in. I had a question about something you said earlier about this kind of hero worship, um, which is definitely present in Elizabeth Holmes, pe people hailing her as the next Steve Jobs and all of that. First of all, hero worshiping Steve Jobs and then hero worshiping her based on this vision of her as Steve Jobs. With this and Elon Musk and all these other people um, in Silicon Valley who we look up to and often fall, are, are fall from grace later on, like Steve Jobs was made out to be a bad manager later on in a biography. Elon Musk has kind of gone off the rails a little bit. Um, <laughs> how closely do you think we should tie these people to their company? And should we predicate our belief on how good they are as a person 
on how successful their company is. Because you said earlier that Theranos failed, but SpaceX and Tesla are successful. Yeah. Um, but there have been multiple pieces saying that the working conditions there are very bad anyway, even despite their success. So I just wondered if you could talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to kind of pull them away from their company because like, people like that just spend all their time on their companies. So I don't know how you separate. Like Elizabeth was Theranos. Yeah. Like the two cannot be separated. Yeah. Steve Jobs is Apple or was Apple. Um, but it's not the case. Majority of companies, that's not actually the case. Because in the U.S., actually, what you see is a lot of founders actually get replaced, and will they'll have like an actual managing CEO run their company in most cases. And it's weird. There have just been these few people that have ma managed to really link themselves to their companies and become the identity of that organization. People like Elon Musk, um, people like Steve Jobs. But I, I, I think it's the minority more than it is the majority uh, uh, of people that kind of are these really strong idols and leaders of their companies. And I don't know, maybe they use Twitter more or maybe I don't know why that happens, but yeah. I'm not too sure. Please join yeah. me in thanking Tyler, Erica, and Sasan. <laughs>